so as you said, I will I will talk about the generalized Wasserstein symbol. Um, so I will begin with a survey on the cancellation problem of projective modules. And then uh, in the second part of the talk, I will introduce the Wasserstein symbol. Um, and I will also talk about my work on the generalized Wasserstein symbol. And then uh, I'll discuss some applications. And towards the end of the talk, I will discuss uh, applications of, of the, well, study of the Wasserstein symbol to uh, the generalized stair question. Okay, so uh, basically always in the talk, uh, R will be a commutative ring uh, with unit of cold dimension D and uh, P will be a finitely generated projective R module of constant rank R. So uh, the cancellation problem asks the following question, does an isomorphism between P plus R to the N and Q plus R to the N for some Q and some N uh, always imply that P is already isomorphic to Q. And if this is the case, then uh, P is said to be cancellative. So if the answer to this question is always yes, then uh, P is said to be cancellative. And um, of course, for inductive purposes, I mean, by induction on N, we can always uh, just consider the following question, does an isomorphism be between P plus R and Q plus R always imply that P is already isomorphic to Q? And uh, this uh, letter question can be rephrased in terms of uh, the stabilization maps, which I'm going to introduce now. Uh, so let um, VR um, denote the set of isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective R modules of constant rank R. Um, and then we can consider the stabilization maps, uh, uh, which sends uh, any isomorphism class represented by some module Q to the module to the class represented by the module Q plus R. So we just add the free module of rank one. And uh, then one is interested in the fiber. So the fiber is just uh, consists of isomorphism classes of modules. Um, represented by some module Q, um, um, such that P plus R is isomorphic to Q plus R. So this is exactly the, 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 the set we are interested in. And hence the main goal is to describe these fibers, to further describe these fibers and study them and show that they are um, um, trivial in some situations. So this is what this is what one is in, interested in. So um, there's a very canonical way of describing these fibers, which I'm going to uh, explain now. Um, so for this, uh, we denote by uh, um p plus r the set of epimorphisms from p plus r to r onto r, uh, always r linear epimorphisms, um, and by odd p plus r the group of automorphisms of um, p plus r. Um, and we notice that um, this group acts on the right on the on this set um p plus r simply by precomposition. So this is the general situation. But uh, if p is free, then we can identify these sets with maybe more known sets or in, in groups. So in this case, any epimorphism is given um, by some row vector of length r plus one. So we can identify this set um p plus r or um r to the r plus one with the set of unimodular rows of length r plus one over r. So row vectors of length r plus one with coefficient, uh, I mean, entries in, in the, which are elements of the ring and such that this row vector defines a surjection. So in other words, uh, such that uh, these entries um, generate r as an ideal. And completely analogously we, analogously, we can identify odd R to the R plus one with the group of invertible matrices of rank R plus one. Okay, so this is the notation. And then we have the following description. Um, this fiber that one is interested in is just the orbit space of um P plus R modular, modular the right action of this automorphism group um, of P plus R. So let me just give you the maps in both directions. So if we start with an epimorphism on this on the left hand side, 
Um, this is ne necessarily split, um, and hence uh, the kernel is exactly um, a projective module of rank R, um, which uh, lies in this fiber. So this is one direction, and the other one is uh, if we have some uh, isomorphism class represented by some Q, um, then there's such an isomorphism between P plus R and Q plus R, then we just send this isomorphism class of Q to the composite of this isomorphism and the projection onto R. And uh, one checks that this is all well-defined in both directions and obviously inverse to uh, one another and hence gives this um, uh, identification. And uh, of course, in the, in the special case, when P is free, we just get that this, this fiber of R to the R plus one is uh, the orbit space of unimodular rows of length R plus one modulo the right action of GLR plus one over R. And uh, yeah, here we have some standard unimodular rows like one, zero, 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 and so on. So in other words, the triviality of this orbit space just means that every unimodular row appears as the first row of some invertible matrix. Um, so these are very um, um, automatic questions. Can any unimodular row completed to an invertible matrix? Okay, so uh, let me now talk about some uh, cancellation results, actual cancellation results. Um, so in 1968, uh, Bas proved the following cancellation theorem. Um, if the rank R of P is uh, large enough, so if it is at least D plus one, and if the ring is notarian, then uh, P is cancellative. So basically, if the, if, if the rank is large enough, then we are at some point in a stable range. So um, every projective module will be um, cancellative. OK, so uh, this is the best result in this generality, because there are some counterexamples, like the real algebraic two-sphere and so on. Um, but in 1977, um, Andre Suslin uh, proved uh, that if R is equal to D, so if the rank of P is equal to the dimension of the ring, and the ring R is in a fine algebra, so a finitely generated algebra over an algebraically closed field, then again, P is cancellative. So in other words, if we're always dealing with affine algebras over algebraically closed fields, then this was an improvement. So uh, if R is at least the dimension, then we know that P is cancellative. And this was slightly extended. Uh, so in 2000, 2003 by Bad Vadeka, so if R is equal to D and R is an affine algebra over an infinite perfect field, with cohomological dimension at most one, and uh, with a property that d factorial is a unit in this space field, then p is cancellative again. So up to some further characteristic assumptions, he extended the result of Suslin uh, to a more general um, base field. Okay, this is sort of classical, sort of known. Um, so basically to sum this up is, if we're just interested in affine algebras over algebraically closed fields, then if R is at least D, then we know that we have cancellation. Um, so that raises the question how, uh, what, what we can prove in the case when R is smaller than, than the dimension D. So um, in 2011, uh, Jean Fazel proved the first result um, in this setting. So, um, if R is smooth, as a smooth affine algebra of dimension three over an algebraically closed field K with characteristic different from two, then at least the free module of rank two is cancellative. In other words, uh, stably free R modules of rank two are free. So as suggested here, he basically settled this case. So if R is two and equal to D minus one and P is free, then he showed that P is cancellative. Okay, and since this, since the proof of this uh, theorem motivates somehow the, my work on the on the Wasserstein symbol, uh, I would like to give a sketch of this proof. Um, so first of all, 
when we have such a stable isomorphism, um, we can already uh, um, apply Susin's cancellation theorem and obtain that uh, R3 is cancellative. And so in other words, um, we have such an isomorphism of this form. R3 is isomorphic to Q plus R. So that just means that Q represents an element in the fiber of the stabilization map of R3. So in other words, one has to prove that this fiber, or in other words, this orbit space is trivial. So what one does is that one uses this, uh, this Wasserstein symbol map, um, which is a map of this form, and I will introduce it later more precisely, but um, Rao van der Kallen uh, proved that this Wasserstein symbol is a bijection and induces a, hence induces a group structure on this orbit space on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have, we have an, uh, the so-called elementary symplectic width group this is an abelian group, so we have a group structure on the left-hand side. And then one basically uses um, further um, properties of this Wasserstein symbol. So um, one uses the following property. So um, one has this, this sum formula. So n times a Wasserstein symbol is just the Wasserstein symbol of the same row where we take the n-fold power in the third coefficient. Um, this is one property, and then this elementary symplectic width group is actually a reduced higher Grodnik width group and can be computed uh, using the gaston Grodnik width spectral sequence. And uh, hence, it can be shown that this is two divisible. And then one uses this uh, Swan Tauber theorem. So any unimodular row of this form is the first row of an invertible matrix of determinant one with uh, of rank three. So this is what we're going to use. And then the, the proof is actually quite quick. Um, so we start with the, with an arbitrary unimodular row. And now we know that uh, this is a bijection, this Wasserstein symbol. So basically everything here can be computed here. So we know that uh, this row has to be two times or uh, twice some other row because this group is two divisible. And then we know, uh, then we ask, what is twice such a row in this group structure? Well, it is by this pro first property, it's just this row, um, B1, B2, B3 squared. But by this one Tauber theorem, we know that this row is the first row of an invertible matrix of, well, determinant one. So um, up to the action of SL3, this is just a standard unimodular row, one, zero, zero. So basically we show that any unimodular row is in the orbit uh, of one, zero, zero under this right action of GL3. So this orbit space is trivial and hence uh, the proof is finished. So this shows that in order to study uh, stably free modules of rank two, this map, this Wasserstein symbol map is always an interesting map to look at, um, and this motivates my work. Can you say where is it used, the algebraic, clo I mean, the fact that the field is algebraically closed for the uh, divisibility this is, or something This is in the divisibility statement and also in this first property, because this whole, this is, this follows from the fact that, uh, well, I think if you would compute it, uh, you would somehow get GW of K and you would write an epsilon here. Mm -hmm. So if, if K is algebraically close, you get just N. Okay. So this is the reason. And then in this computation, also you need uh, that K is algebraically close because uh, yeah, it's basically a spectral sequence. In the spectral sequence, all the groups that appear, um, well, it's a, a lot, there are a lot of computations and you use, you quite often use that case algebraic close. Okay. And you. yeah, this is over commutative rings. So this is very general. So yeah, this is mm -hmm. where we use it. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, even one year later, Fazel Rao Swan uh, proved that, uh, well, basically extended the result of Fazel to higher dimensions. So if R is a normal affine algebra of dimension at least four over an algebraic closed field K, with a property that d minus one factorial uh, is a unit in the base field, then 
the free module of rank D minus one uh, is again cancellative. So in other words, uh, stably free modules of rank D minus one are free. Okay, and this is uh, done in a very similar fashion, also using the Wasserstein symbol. So um, you start with an arbitrary row and then you somehow use the Wasserstein symbol and show uh, that this row can be transformed via elementary matrices to a row of this form. So where the last coefficient is a D minus one factorial for power. And then you don't use the swan tauber theorem because this is only in valid for D equal to three, but you use the, um, well, Susan's famous n factorial um, theorem, which is just, just a generalization of the swan tauber theorem uh, to higher um, Ds, so to higher dimensions in a way. Um, and so this is actually a very important implicit result. So I'm going to use this result that any unimodular row can be transformed to such a row. I will use this later in one of my proofs. So this is a very important implicit result, but that this is what um, really implies cancellation. Um, and then uh, two years later. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, this first step that you said uh, on the previous slide it used this divisibility right uh this this used the visibility yes yeah and here again again yeah. divisibility you have, you have this d minus one d minus one factor exactly yes. okay okay yeah thank you this is uh, what we use to get this yes uh and then in 2014 um um Asok Fazel proved the following. So basically they proved cancellation in, in dimension three for arbitrary P, so for arbitrary projective modules. So if R is a smooth affine algebra of dimension three of an algebraically closed field K uh, with characteristic different from two and uh, P has rank two, then P is cancellative. But their methods were completely different. So um, they showed, they basically completely classified uh, vector bundles of rank two or projective modules of rank two. They showed uh, that this map, this churn class map from the set of isomorphism classes of rank two um, to chow one times chow two is a bijection. Um, and they did this uh, basically by using the affine represent representability results by Asok Oyoa Wendt and then uh, computing A1 homotopy sheaves um, of BGL2 and then using the machinery of A1 Postnikov towers uh, and yeah, very, very heavy machinery of, of A1 Postnikov towers to, to uh, prove that this is actually a bijection. And yeah, this was done very differently uh, um, than all the results before. Okay, so uh, one could ask, so we have settled this ca case if P is free or if the rank is low, so if the rank is two, uh, one could ask uh, what to expect. And there's a um, famous conjecture of Asok Fazel regarding um, the A1 homotopy sheave of um, AD minus zero. Um, so if K is a perfect field with characteristic different from two and D is at least four, then, uh, so this is a conjecture, so then there should be a sequence of this form. So of homomorphisms uh, in the category of strictly A1 invariant um, sheaves of abelian groups, which is exact at this spot um, and also becomes exact at GW D, D plus one uh, after D minus threefold contraction. And uh, just last year, Pang Du um, showed that we should expect cancellation um, in this case when R is D equal to one. So assume the conjecture above holds of an algebraically closed field K with characteristic different from two and for some, yeah, for some D, at least four, such that this D minus one factorial um, is again a unit uh, in the base field. So under this assumption that the conjecture holds, um, we have cancellation. So if R is a smooth affine algebra of dimension D over K and P has rank D minus one and a trivial determinant, this is a further assumption, then P is cancellative. 
yeah so this is just uh, was just settled last year so we should expect we should expect that uh projective well up to this assumption that we have a trivial determinant but i, I think this should be we should be able to drop this assumption at some point um up to this assumption uh we should expect that if r is equal to d minus one um projective modules uh, of rank r should be cancellative so this was just done yeah last year in his phd thesis uh okay so what about the case when r is equal to d minus two so in this case there's a counterexample to cancellation. So let K be an algebraic equal field. Then there's a smooth affine K algebra R of dimension four with a non free, stably free R module of rank two. And this counterexample is due to Mohan Kumar. Um, I think it was published in 1985, if I remember correctly. So this basically shows that we cannot, we cannot prove cancellation in this case. But there's an obvious question. So let R be a Notarian ring of dimension four and P a projective module of rank two with a trivial determinant. Um, then the question is, is there a cohomological criterion for P to be cancellative? Some criterion. And of course, this, this question is particularly interesting already if P is the free module. So is there a, a cohomological criterion for stably free modules to be free? Stably free models of rank two to be free. That's another, that's a special case of this question. So um, that's a very general question. I even didn't assume that we are dealing with some fancy rings, just, just a notarian ring of dimension four. And uh, the approach is motivated by the proof that I sketched. Uh, so the approach is um, to define a generalized Wasserstein symbol of this form. Here we have this elementary symplectic width group that I'm going to introduce in a minute. And we will actually use a, a different group, which is canonically isomorphic. Um, so basically just a different presentation of this group. And uh, then we have this orbit space, um p plus r. And uh, then we uh, consider the right action of this. Well, I will not introduce this, but uh, this is the subgroup of the automorphism group from p plus r. Um, generated by so-called elementary automorphism so if p is free you just get uh, elementary matrices okay so we will define this uh, generalized Wasserstein symbol associated to p and the fixed isomorphism from r to the determinant of p okay so uh just let, let me just introduce the Wasserstein symbol so let me first define this elementary symplectic width group. So let me start with the set AR. So R is a commutative ring with unit. Um, for any N, we then denote by A2N the set of alternating and vertical matrices of rank 2N. So in if, if two is a, a unit in our ring, so for instance, if we have a, an algebra of a base field of character, character characteristic different from two, then alternating just means Q symmetric. So this is just probably known what alternating means, but uh, in most of the situations, it's, it's just the same as Q symmetric. Okay, so then we can def inductively define um, an element Psi 2n, just uh, inductively by setting two psi two like this, and then just uh, recursively uh, inductively, we take the, the, the block sum of matrices. And in particular, we, we obtain embeddings. So if M is smaller than N, then we can embed A2M into A2N of R by simply adding this uh, psi 2N minus 2M in this case just by adding Psi2 uh, several times. Um, so we have an embedding. So we can think of this set as a subset of this set. And hence we can take the union um, and define this to be AR, A of R. And uh, this is not a group, this is just a set. But then we can introduce an equivalence relation on this set. 
So that G either, so we have two possibilities now, ER or SLR. So let G be one of those groups. Then we have an equivalence relation. So M and N are called G equivalent. And this is denoted like this. If there's an integer S and a matrix phi in SL 2M plus 2M plus 2S <laughs> and also in G, such that this equality holds. So what this means is that up to adding psi twos, M and N are isometric. And this isometry comes from a matrix phi, which lies in here. So if, if G is ER, this just means it's stably elementary. Or upon adding more copies of psi two, we can just assume it's elementary. It's in E, it's in E, 2n plus 2n plus 2s. Uh, in the second case, when g is sl, just means that it just means that it is of determinant one, nothing else. So this is this equivalence relation, um, g equivalence, and then we can consider the um, sets of equivalence classes and define them like this. So again, a, pri a priori, this is just a set, but um, I'm not going to do this, but one can show easily that uh, the block sum of matrices equips these sets with the structure of an abelian group. So, so the only really tough part is maybe to, to show that there is an inverse. And, um, but this is not very hard. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's done in the paper by Susan and Wasserstein from 1976. So for instance, uh, a very um, short way of, of telling you what the inverse is. So we, if you have M, you can always add Psi 2. And so we can um, assume that M, this M here, is, is even again. So in other words, the rank of M is divisible by 4. And then the inverse of M is exactly the inverse of M in this group. So the inverse matrix, I mean, the inverse matrix will exactly be the inverse of M in this group. We just have somehow to assume that the rank is divisible by four. Okay, uh, this this is a group. This is not yet the group we need, but we're not far away from it. Um, so now we have a Pfaffian. So any alternating invertible matrix M has a so-called Pfaffian, roughly a square root of, of the determinant. Um, so which satisfies, satisfies the following formula. So the Pfaffian of such a block sum is just uh, the product of both of the Pfaffians of M and N. Uh, if we if we use isometries, that changes one has to that changes the Pfaffian just by by multiplying it with the determinant of this isometry. So in other so in particular, if phi has determinant one, then the, the, this this matrix doesn't change the uh, the, the the Pfaffian, and uh, by convention. Uh, the Pfaffian of psi 2n is always 1. So what this means is that, in particular, the Pfaffian determines a group homomorphism because the group structure here was induced by the block sums. And uh, we have two group homomorphisms, and we can take the kernels of these um, group homomorphisms. So we of r is just the kernel of, of this. I mean, it's a subgroup here. And WSL of R is just the kernel of this um, homomorphism induced by the Pfaffian. OK. Um, yeah. So now I can define the Wasserstein symbol. We start with an arbitrary unimodular row of length 3. And because it, since it is unimodular, we can, we can actually choose um, B1, B2, B3 with the property that this sum is, is 1, because these entries a1, a2, a3 generate uh, r as an ideal. And then we can consider the following matrix. Um, and the element of we prime defined by this matrix has actually Pfaffian 1 and does not depend on the choice of b1, b2, b3. So maybe I explain a little bit this here. So the Pfaffian, there's a very explicit formula for the Pfaffians. 
as for determinants of a matrix. So the, the, it turns out that the Fafian of such a matrix is, is exactly this sum here. So, another, so one in particular. And then one can uh, come up with very explicit uh, isometries. So a very explicit matrix, which lies in E4. So if you have B and we have another, you choose another section, say B prime, then we have a very explicit matrix e, in E4, which uh, um, transforms VAB to VAB prime. And so, since it is in E4, this doesn't change the element in WE prime. So we have a matrix which represents uh, an element in WE prime. This has Fafian 1. So in other words, it's in WE of R, in the kernel of the Fafian. And hence, uh, we obtain a well-defined map on this orbit space, which maps to, the, to this group WE of R, which I didn't say, but is called the elementary symplectic width group. And uh, one has to check, of course, that this is compatible with this action here, which is not very hard. And one also has, one can also check that one has an induced map on this, uh, on this orbit space, UM3 modulo SL3 of R, uh, which maps into this group WSL of R. So this is the Wasserstein symbol. And uh, yeah, this is sometimes, also called the Wasserstein symbol or the Wasserstein symbol modulo SL, but this is the actual Wasserstein symbol. Okay, um, then I well, yeah, this is the Wasserstein symbol, but one, one can also um, reinterpret this map um, in terms of A1 homotopy theory. And this is what I want to explain now. Um, for this, uh, we have to um, assume that X, or spec R is a, is a smooth affine scheme of finite type over a perfect base field, K, with characteristic different from two. Um, then uh, for any natural number, we have this representability result uh, due to Morel, Schlichting, Asok, Euro, Wendt, uh, which asserts that we have such an identification. So vector bundles or projective modules of rank R are represented um, in the A1 homotopy category. Um, so X plus is just X within, with a dis well, maybe you, are, you know this statement without this plus and in the, um, well, this is the pointed A1 homotopy category. Um, maybe you know this without the base points, but this by, by equivalent adjunction is just this. Um, so X plus is X with a disjoint base point formally added base point and DGLR is just a simpler short classifying space of uh, GLR. And yeah, this is the representability result. And we also have an A1 fiber sequence in this unstable A1 homotopy category over the base field K of this form. And this is just induced by the inclusion of GLR into GLR plus one. And the uh, A1 homotopy fiber then has to be GLR plus one modulo GLR. So this is A1 weakly equivalent to AR plus one minus zero. And this induced map just corresponds via these identifications to the stabilization map phi R. Okay, so this is the setting in A1 homotopy theory. And, but then one also has a representability result on this, on this A1 homotopy fiber. So if R is at least two, a result of Fazel, I think from 2011 or 12, gives an identification uh, of, this, of this form. So, um, morphisms from X plus to AR plus one minus zero correspond to unimodular rows. I think this is somehow clear because uh, a unimodular row is a row vector of length R plus one. So this naturally gives, an, gives a morphism into the affine, sp affine space of dimension R plus one. And the fact that it is unimodular just corresponds to the fact that it doesn't, I mean, it misses the zero section. So, 
this is clear, but up to A1 homotopy, this means that we just take uh, the right action um, of ER plus one. So this we have this identification, and then we have further representability results on um, hem in Hermitian cave theory. So representability results of Schlichting Triparty in Hermitian cave theory give uh, ID and the identifications of the following form. We prime of R is just as by definition is this set A AR up to elementary matrices. But these correspond to elementary A1 homotopy, uh, naive A1 homotopies. So this is just X plus to A, where A is the, well, it's the co limit of all the A2N, A2Ns, but A2N is just a scheme of uh, alternating or skew-symmetric matrices of rank 2N. It's just the co limit of, of all of them in a similar way as A is just the co limit of, of all the A2Ns. And this space, uh, this simplicial Nisnevich sheaf, is just isomorphic to the quotient a GL modulo SP. But this is by Schlichting Tripathi, is just uh, the space which represents uh, this higher Grotnik width group, GW13 of X. So we have this representability result, and now we can somehow define the Wasserstein symbol. Uh, in terms of uh, morphisms, um, so first of all, some sign convention. Let tau, or we don't denote by tau, the morphism which changes the sign of some coordinates. So sends x1 to x1, x2 to minus x2, x3 to x3 onto co coordinates on A3. So x1, x2, x3 are supposed to be the coordinates of this affine space of dimension three. And then we can consider the following composite. So I, I call it psi three for a reason that we'll I explain in a minute. So we just uh, change this sign here, just the just the sign convention. Then we identify uh, a three minus zero with this quotient SL three modulo SL two. This is a one. This is an a one weak equivalence. Um, but then we can look at the inclusion of SL three into SL four, and uh, I think it is in the paper on the KO degree map. Uh, Asok Fazel proved that this map is actually, so SL2 is, is SP2, that's the same group. So this fact is, this is a well-defined morphism. And Asok Fazel proved that this is actually an isomorphism. And then we simply, so up to identifications, basically, we just take the inclusion or the, the stability map. So SL4, SP4 naturally maps into GL modulo SP. And it turns out that the composite of these natural morphisms induces a map, first of all, psi three star. Um, and this map just corresponds to the Wasserstein symbol. And uh, I've not yet explained uh, why we call this map psi three. So in this pa paper by Asok Fazel, they introduce uh, so-called degree morphisms um, and psi, psi n for any n, and this is just psi three. So this is one of these degree morphisms um, which I studied in this paper. And uh, it turns out that the Wasserstein symbol is such a, well, is induced by such a degree morphism, um, at least in, in a case of a smooth affine scheme. Um, at least in the situation that I just described. Okay, so this is the A1 homotopic interpretation of the Wasserstein symbol. And this is also used in some papers uh, by Fazel um, to, to study the um, surjectivity and injectivity of the Wasserstein symbol by um, motivic uh, machineries like Posnikov towers and, and so on, obstruction theory. Um, but I'm now, well, yeah, this is a, there's a very elementary way of studying these questions, which, I, which I'll explain later. But now we can uh, discuss the generalized Wasserstein symbol. So there's a generalization of all of this. And as I said before, I will use a different group. I will use this group VR and V tilde R um, that I'm going to introduce now. Um, which will be canonically isomorphic to W 
we prime of r and we of r so let r be a commutative ring and uh, consider the set of triples of this form where p is a finitely generated projected r module and uh, f and g are non-degenerated and non-degenerate alternating forms on p and we call two such triples so p f0 f1 p prime f0 prime f1 prime isometric if there exists well if there exists an isometry so if there's an isomorphism such that this equality holds and this by the way this notation is just um, motivated by the notation for matrices so this just means that we use this as an isometry i uh, hope it's not too uh, confusing so we we don't have matrices here if we're dealing with projective modules but this is just means we take h to be an isometry from fi prime to fi okay and then we uh oops uh, one notation um we denote by um PGF like this, uh, the isometry class of the of this triple with round brackets. PGF. Okay, so now the group VR is just the quotient of the free abelian group on isometry classes of such triples of triples as before, modulo the following relations, modulo the subgroup generated by the relations for the following relations. So it's compatible with the orthogonal sum. Um, and uh, the following relation, P F0 F1 plus P F1 F2 is just P F2 F0 F2 for non-degenerated alternating forms F0 F1 F2 on a projective module P. So this just tells you how to think of these triples. Um, you basically should think of them as a formal difference of, of alternating forms. So you should think of this like, uh, uh for instance f1 minus f0 because then this equality becomes obvious so f1 minus f0 plus f2 minus f1 and so on and then uh, it becomes quite obvious okay that this relation should hold so uh one has an obvious map so sending uh an alternating matrix to this triple And this induces a well-defined map from WE prime of R to VR. And it turns out that this is an isomorphism. And then we obviously have a subgroup. So we had WE of R as a subgroup here. This was the Pfaffian one part. So the kernel of the Pfaffian homomorphism. So analogously, we here have a subgroup. So we just denote by V tilde of R, the subgroup corresponding to W E of R under this isomorphism. And then we also have an analog of WSL. So VSL of R is just the quotient of VR modulo the subgroup um, generated by the relation PGF is equal to PG uh, phi T F phi um, for non-degenerated alternating forms GF on P and any phi which is of determinant one, any automorphism on P, which is of determinant one. So this is just the relation to make this map also an isomorphism on these quotients. So um, again, we have this natural map and this um, induces, um, as before, induces an isomorphism. So WSL prime is then just isomorphic to VSL. And naturally, we can we have a group subgroup here corresponding to WSL here, so the Pfaffian one part, um, and we don't denote by V tilde SL of R the subgroup corresponding to WSL under this isomorphism. Can you define? We, can, yeah? can, can you define it in some internal terms? I mean, without this isomorphism. Uh, what define what? I mean, the, this subgroup. I mean, can, can you phrase this uh, yeah, yeah. one condition somehow? Yeah, somehow, yes. Um, so the Pfaffian, well, it's a bit more difficult, but uh, if, if say P is free, then the Pfaffian just is then the, the difference of the Pfaffian of M minus the Pfaffian 
or divided by the Puffian of this. So you could say uh, the Puffian has to be the same here. These are the triples where the Puffian mm -hmm. is the same. But uh, if, if a P is a projective module, not necessarily free, uh, I don't think one has a Puffian on such uh, forms. So one should add Q such that P plus Q is free and then you somehow have to, to um, represent every element by such such a um, triple such that we have the free module here. And then you can just say that these triple, the, the, the Puffians of both matrices here have to be the same in a way. So this is one way to very quickly define it. But I would say the easiest way is to just look at this isomorphism and say, we have a corresponding group. I think you always have a Puffian. I mean, you have Fafan locally, yeah. Then yes, you... yes, yes, sure. So I mean, for any free, for any projective model. Mm -hmm. so you, yeah, yeah. You could say that locally, the Fafan has to be the same. Yeah, that made. Yeah, this is a way to define it, maybe. Okay. So, yeah. so locally, G and F have to have the same Fafan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, yeah. So now let me define the generalized Wasserstein symbol. So uh, let P be a projective R module of rank two with a fixed uh, trivial trivialization um, theta uh, of its determinant. So we automatically have, um, because of this assumption, we have a non-degenerate non -degenerate alternating form on P simply given by sending, uh, so this is denoted by chi, uh, we send p and q p comma q to the inverse so p wedge q is here and then we take the inverse and land in the ring r and this is obviously alternating um yeah so we just have this form and uh, now we want to define this generalized Wasserstein symbol so we start with an element in um p plus r so in just an epimorphism from P plus R onto R. And hence we have this, uh, the, any such element gives rise to an exact sequence of this form. So we just take the kernel here and um, this is split. So this is necessarily split uh, because R is free and uh, obviously. Uh, so any section um, from R to P plus R uh, of A determines an isomorphism of this form. So from P plus R uh, to P A plus R, P A is the kernel of A. And uh, in particular, these are stably isomorphic, P plus R and P A plus R. Um, and the determinant of P A is also free because the determinant of P A is the determinant of P. So we, we obtain an isomorphism on determinants. So the determinant of P A is also free and we have an isomorphism theta A from R onto the determinant of PA simply by composing with theta. So theta was the isomorphism from R to dead P. And then we just compose to get an isomorphism to dead PA. So in particular, we have just the same as before. So we denote by chi A now, the non-degenerate alternating form on PA given by the same formula, basically. So PA times PA to R we send PQ to the inverse of theta A of P wedge Q. So now we have an element that we can consider. So we call it, this is the analog of the matrix we were considering earlier when defining the Wasserstein symbol. So V theta of A comma S is the following triple. So we consider P plus R2 we have this form chi induced by the trivialization of that P. And we take the orthogonal sum with uh, psi two. So this is de definitely an alternating form on P plus R2. But philosophically, we would like to compare this. We would like to compare this form with the with basically the same on, on, on PA. So chi A plus plus uh, psi two. The problem is that this is defined on pi, uh, PA plus R2. So in order to fix this, we just take this isometry. Um, I was the isomorphism from P plus R 
uh, to PA plus R and well, if we just add the identity to have an isomorphism here from P plus R to PA plus R, and then we can take this form. So we basically consider the formal difference of these forms um, philosophically in a way. And it turns out that this element in VR does not depend on the section of this epimorphism. So this is completely analogous as for the original Wasserstein symbol. So in particular, we get a map, one obtains the generalized Wasserstein symbol um, of this form. So it's defined on this orbit space. One of course has to check that it is compatible with this right action. And one also has to check uh, that it is actually in this Fafian one part. So in this subgroup V tilde of R, um, but this is not hard. Um, so one has this generalized Wasserstein symbol associated to P and theta. And one can also prove that there is an induced map on this orbit space um, um P plus R modulo SL P plus R. And this will map into V tilde of SL. So here we have the analog of WE of R. Here we have the analog of WSL of R. So we have, um, yeah, something completely analogous to the to the original Wasserstein symbol um, and to the induced map that I was also mentioning earlier. Um, so the natural question is: Is somehow the original Wasserstein symbol a special case of this? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so. So the connection with the user, usual Wasserstein symbol is the following. If we have the free module, uh, we have a, well, that's a trivial remark, but we, <laughs> we have a, a, a standard basis and hence there's a canonical isomorphism from R to the determinant of R2, simply by sending one to this, to this E1 wedge A2. Uh, and unfortunately, we would like to consider um, we would hope that V of this, the Wasserstein symbol associated to this trivialization is the original Wasserstein symbol, but it turns out there's the wrong, somehow something goes wrong, namely the sign, and we have to, to fix something. <laughs> so the generalized Wasserstein symbol associated to minus theta, which is also a nice morphism, of course, uh, this is uh, actually the, the Wasserstein symbol. So, up to some, some sign conventions, it, it is the same. Uh, so the generalized Wasserstein symbol associated um, to R2 and minus theta coincides with the usual Wasserstein symbol via the canonical isomorphism between V tilde of R and WE of R. Yeah, so it is a special case, but not the one that we were hoping for maybe <laughs> because of some sign convention. Um, okay. So basically everything is a special case from now on. So one, uh, we, have, we have these maps and naturally in order to study these orbit spaces, we would like to study the injectivity and surjectivity of these maps. Also of this one, but I'm going to discuss this one in this talk. So um, for this, let me introduce some notation. So um, for n at least three, we let Pn be the projective module p plus r to the n minus two. So this will always have rank n. And uh, then we have an element in there. So just the element with co last coordinate one and all the other co coordinates are zero. So the criterion for the surjectivity uh, of this induced map is the following. So let r be a Notarian ring of cold dimension at most four. Then V theta of this form is surjective if SL P5, so P5 is defined like this, uh, acts transitively on the right on um P5. So the set of epimorphisms from P5 to R. So if this acts transitively on here, then this map is surjective. And this is actually not a, not a very strong assumption as we will see uh, in a minute. So I should say that the special case of this was covered by results of Suslin and Wasserstein in 1976. So 
If I was in the Terran ring uh, of full dimension at most four, then this original this original Wasserstein symbol or this original induced map by the Wasserstein symbol is subjective. If F if SL5, this is just the analog of if P3, SL5 um, acts uh, transitively on um five, on the set of unimodular rows of length five. Okay. Um, so this was already known. So this is a just a very straightforward general generalization. Then uh, the, the injectivity is much trickier. Um, so just some notation. Um, so for any non-degenerate alternating form, uh, M on P, uh, P2N, we just uh, denote by SPM all the automorphisms of P2N, which are symplectic with respect to M. So which satisfy this equation. Okay, then uh, the injectivity result is the following. So this was also done in my thesis, uh, in my PhD thesis. Uh, so let R be an Unitarian ring of cold dimension at most four. Then we have to assume that, uh, moreover assume that SLP5 acts transitively on UMP5. So this, if you remember from the previous slide, this was just the assumption that this map is subjective. Um, so we basically assume that the map is subjective then the map is injective if and only if um, this equality holds SLP4 E4 is equal to SPM E4. E4 was, well, maybe I go back now. E4 was this element, if you rem remember. Um, so all the coordinates are zero except the last one, which is one. So if this equality holds, um, for all non-degenerate um, alternating forms M on P4, such that, and this is maybe technical, but such that this element defines an, uh, such that this triple defines an element of V tilde of SL of R. It's, it's a triple, so it's definitely in V SL of R, but not necessarily in V tilde SL of R. Uh, it just means that it is in a kernel of this Pfaffian homomorphism. So uh, this is just a very, um not well not very straightforward but kind of easy uh translation of injectivity which is done in my thesis and so one has to check whether these orbits so now we have these groups on the left and we have an element of p4 on the right so one has to check whether these uh sets orbits are already uh, are always equal so uh this wasn't covered, by the way, by Susan and Wasserstein. Um, so just maybe it becomes easier to understand what this means uh, when we look at the special case when P is free. So in this case, this just means the following. So let R be an Unitarian ring of dimension at most four, such that SL5 acts transitively on UM5. So this was just this assumption here. And then this, this induced map, this map induced by the Wasserstein symbol, is injective if and only if SL4 of R E4 times E4 is SPM times E4 for all uh, alternating um, matrices of rank four with Pfaffian one. So this is the analog of this of this uh, property. So this is in, in case P is free, we can just say that M has to have Pfaffian one. And E4 is just this column vector, so 0, 0, 0, 1. So one has to check that these uh, equalities hold. And this is looks complicated, but there are standard techniques to check such equalities. So um, I'm going to, to prove um, a bijectivity result of this map. So necessarily, in order to prove this, we have to um, deal with such uh, equalities. And this is what I'm going to uh, explain now. So one is naturally interested in such orbits of, of this symplectic groups, SPM, for any matrix M, alternating matrix M. So uh, there are some results regarding such questions. So in uh, 2015, Anjan Gupta, who was a student of Ravi Rao, Prove the following. So let R be a smooth or fine algebra of dimension at least four over an algebraically closed field K 
with uh, d factorial being a unit in the base field. And he assumed, he assumed that d is 2 modulo 4. Then he proved that SPD acts transitively on the right, by the way, on the right on um d, the set of unimodular rows. But if we look at the criterion for the injectivity of the Wasserstein symbol, we need much more. We don't just need uh, SPD or something like that. Uh, we need some general results, and this was done just recently. Um, so let R be a smooth or fine algebra of even dimension uh, D, which is supposed to be at least four, over an algebraically closed field K with D factorial being a unit. So exactly the same setting here. Um, but no assumption on D, no further assumption. Then SPM acts transitively on the set of unimodular rows for any M, for any M in AD, so any alternating uh, or skew symmetric matrix of rank D. So um, I want to explain the proof now. Um, and actually also is a generalization of the proof of this result. Um, so as a special case, we obtain the original proof by Anand Gupta uh, of this result. So what we have to prove is the following. Um, so we want to show that SPM acts transitively on unimodular rows. So in particular, there's only one orbit. Uh, so we can just show the following. If we take the standard unimodular row, one, zero, 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 and so on. Then we just have to show that the orbit of this row is, is already everything. So another way of saying this is that the first row or any unimodular row appears as the first row of some symplectic matrix, symplectic with respect to M. Um, okay, let's do this. So there are two reduction steps. So we start with an arbitrary unimodular row and uh, for a moment, just assume the following. Assume that we have phi A of determinant one, such that this is a completion of this row A, A1, A2, and so on to AD. So this is exactly the kind of matrix we are looking for, but we're not assuming it is uh, symplectic with respect to M. We just assume that uh, it is in the image of the forgetful map from symplectic from K1 to algebraic K1. Uh, so this is weaker than what we actually want, but we are going to see that this is enough. So um, the rank of M is D, is, which is the dimension of R. So for some stability results um, um, in uh, symplectic K theory, we know that um, psi, there is psi in SPM, uh, such that the classes in K1 are equal. So maybe this is known in case uh, of SPD, so SP of Psi D, but it turns out that the computations, this is done in my paper, also work for SPM. So maybe if you are familiar with stability questions in uh, symplectic K theory, you know that this is definitely true for SPD, but not necessarily, it's maybe not clear to SPM, and this is done in my paper. It's it, the same proof works for SPM. So we have this stability that phi A is already equal to psi, which is an SPM stably, so in K1. But now we have, and I didn't mention this before, but Fazel Rao Swan proved uh, cancellation, um, but they also proved as a corollary proved that this map from SLD modulo ED to SK1 is injective. So they proved K1 stability. So what this means that this difference in K1 is trivial. So in other words, this difference of matrices is stably elementary, but by this stability result, it's elementary. So this difference is in ED of R, simply because of the stability result. And now, uh, I think this is due to Wasserstein. Uh, we have an equality of these orbits. This is well known. Uh, I think it was proven in the 1970s by Wasserstein. Um, so 
this is elementary. So if we consider pi, uh, where is it? Pi uh, times this here, this is elementary. We know because of this equality of orbits that there has to be tau in this intersection of ED and SPM such that this equality holds simply because of this equality of orbits. And now we multiply this, this equation simply by psi on the right and we get what we want because on the right means that we get pi phi a, which was by assumption a. And on the, on the right, we get pi tau psi. But tau is symplectic with respect to m and psi is symplectic with respect to m. So this product is symplectic with respect to m. And now if we, we have written A as the first row of a matrix, which is symplectic with respect to m. So all we have to find is, because of stability results essentially, all we have to find a mic, all we have to do is to find a matrix phi A for any row A with this weaker property. So it's just, it's not symplectic with respect to M, but only in the image of the forgetful map. So this is what I just said. So for any row, it suffices to find phi A as above. So this was the first reduction step. The second re reduction step uh, has to do, has something to do with uh, the result by Fazel Raus one. So uh, what they did is, and I mentioned this, uh, earlier in the talk. So any row can be transformed by elementary matrices to a row um, of the form B prime, where the last coefficient is a D minus one factorial for power. So assume, so just, just write this in terms of matrices, so A is just B prime times phi, where phi is a matrix in ED. So this is just another way of saying this. And now assume for a moment that we have already found phi B prime. So just the matrix we are looking for for this row. Then we simply define phi A by the following formula, phi B prime times phi. This is this matrix appearing here. And then simply, uh, yeah, by construction, phi A is a completion of A. So if we write pi phi A, this will automatically be A. And since phi is elementary, the class in K1 of phi A and phi B prime will be the same. So if phi B prime is in the image of the forgetful map from symplectic K1 to K1, the same holds for phi A. So we are done. So what this tells us is that we have another reduction step, basically. So it actually suffices to find this matrix phi B prime. So remember, I just said we just have to find phi A for any row A. So this tells us that we don't have to find phi A for any row A, just, just for rows of this form. So it actually suffices to find phi B prime for a row of the form B prime where the last coefficient is this power, this D minus one factorial for power. So this is all what is left to do to find phi B prime for such rows. So phi B prime should be a completion of this row and should be uh, in the, well, it's class in K1 of R should be in the image of the forgetful map from symplectic K1 of R to K1 of R. So the idea to do this to, to verify that something like this exists for such rows, phi B prime exists for such rows, is to use Suzlin matrices. A uh, quick reminder, just one slide uh, on Suzlin matrices. So if you have a unimodular row of length D and you pick a section, Y1 to Yd, so section just means that this equality holds, uh, then we can also consider such a row where we take the power in the last coefficient. So I can denote this by X prime, just as before with B. Um, then the Suzlin matrix construction gives, gives invertible matrices. So first of all, the Suzlin matrix SD 
of x comma y, which is of rank two to the d minus one. And then a matrix beta x, y, which is of rank D, such that the following conditions hold. So first of all, beta x, y is a completion of x prime. So the first row of beta x, y is just x prime. So this row. And we are now interested in this type of rows, as, as, as we have seen. And uh, this, this matrix beta x, y is equal to the class of this, the class of this beta x y x y is equal to the class of the Susan matrix S D x y in K one or in S K one. So this is a yeah basically the reason why Susan constructed these matrices and uh, if D is equal to two modulo four, then it's just a very uh, well known well-known property of Susan matrices that this Susan matrix is in the image of the of this forgetful map that we are interested in and some further properties because so this will give us in a minute give us the proof in the case that uh, that these two modulo four uh, but we need more because we want to cover all the cases um, so if if we transform such a row x by elementary matrices, so if, if z is another unimodular row and z is just x times phi for some matrix in ED, so just some elementary matrices, um, then the class doesn't change. So the Susan matrix of x and y, x comma y, will be the Susan matrix of z and well the so, well, the induced section. So y is a section to x, then naturally y times the inverse times, well, times the transpose of the inverse of phi. So this is noted by minus t here, um, will be a section to z. So these classes will also coincide. And then some, maybe not well known, but not very hard, uh, not very, uh, difficult property, very easy to see, not very easy, but it's not hard to see this. Uh, if we have such a situation, then this matrix is also in the image of the, of the um, forgetful map that we are interested in, in case D is zero modulo four. And if one of the entries of Z is a square in, in the ring R, so these are the properties of Susan matrices that can be, I mean, so the first three properties are just well known. The fourth one is proven in my paper by, well, it's not very hard, but would be quite technical now. Um, basically, the reason is uh, that you have a universal uni uh, Susan matrix. So you only have to prove it universally. You can also think of the Susan matrix as a morphism from AD minus zero to, um, the space uh, representing K theory, so BGL. And then you can basically do these computations, these relations, you can check them universally. So this is done in my paper. Uh, so these are the properties that we are going to use now. So just one slide. So back to the proof. So let B be the row as before, if you remember and <laughs> choose uh, a section. And I will remind you what we have to prove again, uh, because it's quite technical, maybe. Uh, so we have such a section. And then we let B prime again denote this, this row. And then uh, where the last coefficient is a power. And then uh, uh, it remains to show the following. It remains to show this was the reduct the two reduction steps basically. It remains to show that there's phi b prime such that uh, phi b prime is a completion of b prime. So we have a matrix of determinant one whose first row is just this row b prime, and the class of phi b prime is in this image of, of this forgetful map. So we have just seen uh, the properties of Susan matrices. So we're just going to define phi b prime as this matrix beta b u um, from the Susan matrix construction. 
And then automatically we have that the first row of phi b prime is just, well, this is by definition just the first row of beta bu. And this was by construction, the Susan matrix properties just b prime, if you remember from the previous slide. Uh, now we have two cases because we want to verify the second property. So this was the case if d is 2 modulo 4, and this was discovered by Anjan Gupta, um, where everything is easier a little bit. Um, so if d is 2 modulo 4, then the class of phi b prime is just the class of beta bu, but this is the same as the class of sd bu, so of the Susan matrix. Matrix, and if you remember from the previous slide, in this case, when d is 2 modulo 4, this is automatically uh, symplectic. So, state a uh, well in the image of the forgetful map um, from symplectic K1 to K1. So, it gets a little bit, a little bit, only a little bit trickier when we deal with the case that d is 0 modulo 4. So, in this case, Fazel Raus 1 proved something which we'll use again. So they prove that we can transform B via element, an elementary matrix phi to row C of the form again, that the last coefficient is a D minus one factorial for power. We can do that with any row. That's what they prove. So now it follows that phi B prime, which is just beta BU, uh, the class of phi b prime is just the class of the Susan matrix SDBU, but this is the same by the properties on the previous slide. Uh, it's just the same as the Susan matrix of C. And C has a square because the last coefficient is a d minus one factorial full power. So by the previous slide, by the properties listed there, this will again be in the image of the forgetful map uh, from symplectic K1 to algebraic K1. So in any case, uh, we have verified that such a phi, by, phi b prime exists. So in other words, uh, this finishes the proof. OK, so let me re remind you again what we just proved. <laughs> uh, so we proved uh, that SPM acts transitively on the set of unimodular rows of length d. So we can now. Um, prove some bijectivity results. So let R be a smooth or fine algebra of dimension four of an algebraic closed field K with the property that six is a unit, it's just a technical assumption. Um, then this induced map, this map induced by the Wasserstein symbol uh, is bijective and induces a group structure on this orbit space, OM3 of R modulo SL3 of R. So uh, this follows from the criteria that we had before so by Susan's cancellation theorem, SL5 acts transitively on UM5. And this was exactly our criterion for the surjectivity of the Wasserstein symbol. So the Wasserstein symbol or this induced map is surjective. Now the injectivity part. So first of all, let's start with a matrix uh, of Fafian 1. Now, um, yeah, there's a technical reason why I picked the inverse now. So the inverse of M is again uh, in A4 and has again Fafian 1, obviously. So um, the previous transitivity result, we just proved that for any M, so in particular for the inverse of M, this group will act transitively on the set of unimodular rows on the right. So uh, if we pick 0, 0, 0, 1, this will be um, this orbit will be everything, all the set of all the whole set of unimodular rows of length four. So there's a reason now why I picked uh, the inverse of M, because if we now take the transpose, we just take the transpose of this equality. If we the transpose of a matrix symplectic to the inverse of M will be symplectic to M, with respect to M. So by transposition, it follows that if we write SPM on the left, so this is basically a technicality. So if we pick uh, SPM here on the left and this element E4, then uh, this equality holds. So it's just a transposition of this e equality, basically. And we have to take care that 
here we have m here so we have to take n m inverse here so that's the only reason um, and this is exactly the criterion for the injectivity so we have just verified the criterion for the injectivity so v is indeed injective so um, surjective and injective so bijective and uh, we can define the group structure on this orbit space just by using this uh, bijection so the the theorem is proven this was just recently uh okay so what's the consequence this was actually already uh discovered in my phd thesis but uh i didn't know that this Wasserstein symbol was bijective uh i just knew that this orbit space is trivial if and only if this group is trivial because i didn't know that this is actually injective i just knew that spd sp4 sorry uh, was acting transitively so I, I, my information was a little bit less but it still was enough to conclude that uh, the following theorem which is now easier um, so let r be a smooth affine algebra of dimension four over an algebraic closed field k with the property that six is a unit in k so as before then um, all stably free r modules of rank two are free if and only if this group WSL uh, is trivial. So uh, let me prove this also very quick. So start with the stable isomorphism of this form. So R2 plus Rn is isomorphic to Q plus Rn. Then we can already assume Fazel Rao Swan, um, which was proven in 2012. So R3, which is a frank D minus one here. So R3 is cancellative. So in other words, we have an isomorphism of this form. And now Q represents an element in the fiber of the stabilization map. So we have to show that this fiber is trivial. So in other words, um, all stably free R modules of rank two are trivial if and only if this orbit space uh, is trivial. But so this means that every unimodular row, because we have this row 100, zero, zero, any unimodular row is the first row of an invertible matrix. But it's a very easy to see that this holds if and only if this quotient is trivial, um, because this just means that every unimodular row is the first row of an invertible matrix of determinant one. So it's very easy to see that this is equivalent. Um, and we've just seen that this orbit space, uh, that, well, there's a bijection from this orbit space to WSL. So um, this orbit space is trivial uh, if and only if WSL of R is trivial. So this is what we wanted to show. So all stable free R modules of rank two are free if and only if this group um, is trivial. Okay. Yeah, some I will now some further applications. So just just two, just to tell you that there's there are much more applications, but I, I just uh, focused on on a few of the major applications. So there are some others. So as before, let P be a projective R module uh, of rank two with a fixed trivialization um, of its determinant. Then um, we can also consider this map, this actual generalized Wasserstein symbol. So I always uh, consider this induced map. But one can also do something similar for the, for the actual generalized Wasserstein symbol. So this map V theta this generalized Wasserstein symbol is a bijection if R is a two-dimensional regular Unitarian ring or a three-dimensional regular affine algebra over a perfect field with a cohomological dimension at most one and with the property that six is a unit. So uh, such assumptions on the characteristic will always uh, appear in such theorems, I guess. So um, yeah, in low dimensions in dimension two and three, this is again a bijection and this three dimensional case is just the generalization of a result I uh, Fazel um, used in his in his result from 2011 on stably free modules of three on three folds. Uh, if you remember, you used this result by Rao van der Kallen, and this is just a generalization of their result in dimension three. Um, and uh, also more recently, one can one can actually generalize 
well, not very generalized, but one can somehow apply the techniques of Fazel Rao Swan to a more general case. So um, if R is a smooth affine algebra of dimension four over an algebraically closed field K with characteristic different from two or three, then, uh, and if Q is a projective R module of rank three, whose churn classes are all trivial, then Q is cancellative. So this, as I just said, this is done exactly in the same, well, the same idea of proof as the theorem by Fazel Raus one. So it's the same approach uh, using this, this theorem in particular for three folds. Um, but yeah, I don't have time to discuss the proof, the whole proof of this. So it's just very similar to, to, to the proof of Fazel Raus one. Um, and this is one major, one other major application so far. It might be possible in the future to drop this assumption that the second churn class is trivial, but uh, at the moment I don't know how to do it. But should it should be, it could be possible at least. This assumption is always uh, necessary when we deal with the generalized Wasserstein symbol because we always assume that we're dealing with uh, oriented projective modules or with projective modules with trivial determinants. And this is also, if you look at the proof of, in my paper, then this is also quite necessary. But it could be possible to drop this uh, assumption on the second churn class. Okay. Uh, Can I, yeah? Small question. Uh, are there, I mean, you have this assumption on the triviality of churn classes. Uh, are there any non -sta stably non free guys? Uh, so I mean, stably non trivial guys, which has trivial chain classes? Uh, this is an open question itself. So this is, uh, at the moment, it might be possible that this is actually not a new uh, theorem. So this, it might be possible that every projective module of rank three, as in this theorem, might already be free. So this wouldn't be a new one, a new theorem. Um, so at the moment, we don't know this because we don't know how to classify uh, rank three vector bundles um, on, on, on four folds. Um, so yeah, this, this is an open question. So it might be interesting to look at this question uh, uh, in the future. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now and the remainder of the talk, I will talk about the generalized SER question. So um, just a reminder probably. Um, so if we have a field that admits an embedding into the complex numbers, um, we can associate it as associate to any smooth K variety X um, uh, an associated complex manifold, which is denoted like this, uh, an associated analytic space or, or a complex manifold, um, which depends on, uh, on this embedding, of course. And uh, a smooth K variety X is called topologically contractible if this analytic space, this, this associated complex manifold is a contractible topological space for any embedding iota from K to, to the complex numbers. And uh, the, the most basic example, so the affine spaces uh, are the primordial examples of uh, topologically contractible um, smooth affine K schemes. So, yeah, let me just remind you, but I think this is known. Uh, so, in 1955, Sayer asked the following question. So, if K is a field, are uh, all algebraic vector bundles on this affine space A and K trivial? And this was uh, solved independently by Quillen and Suslin in 1976. So, if K is a field, then all algebraic vector bundles on the affine space are trivial. Okay, so because of this uh, notion of topological, topologically contractible uh, affine varieties, uh, it's only natural to ask the generalized SER question. So if X spec R is, is topologically contractible, smooth affine complex variety, then are all algebraic vector bundles on X uh, trivial? Um, let me... Uh, mention some results on this. Um, so first of all, a very general approach. So uh, it's just a trivial remark. Uh, so we have this SAS split, we have SAS splitting, splitting theorem. So if R is a 
commutative Noetherian ring of dimension D, and you consider a projective, finally generated projective module P of rank R, which is greater than D, then uh, this will always be of the form P prime plus R to the R minus D uh, for some projective R module P prime of constant rank D. So this just means that um, we can always focus on projective models um, of rank D or whose rank is at most D because if the rank is higher than D then we just write it as a sum of, of this form and then we only have to prove that P prime is, is free. So um, when, when, when one deals with this generalized Serre question one only has to care about projective modules whose rank is uh, less than or equal to the, to the dimension. Okay, so in 1980, uh, Goya proved that if X is a topologically contractible smooth of fine complex variety of any dimension, then uh, Chao one will be trivial, Chao one of X. So in other words, line bundles will be trivial, always trivial um, uh, on topologically contractible uh, smooth of fine complex varieties. So because of this Sayre splitting theorem, this means that in dimension one, we all ha already have an answer. So if, if X is a topologically contractible smooth of fine complex variety of dimension one, then all algebraic vector bundles on X are trivial. So this is an immediate corollary of this computation here. Um, so what about higher dimensions? So in 1989, Goya Shastri uh, proved the following result. So if X, uh, is a topologically contractible smooth fine complex variety of dimension two. So now we have a dimension assumption, then uh, Chow two is trivial. So again, by um, some classif classification theorems, this implies that um, if X is a topologically, topologically contractible smooth fine complex variety of dimension two, then all algebraic vector bundles on X are again trivial simply because, first of all, we only have to care about rank one and rank two because we are in dimension two. So rank one is settled by the result of Goya, who said that Chao, who proved that Chao one is trivial always. And now one has a very general, well known classification of projective models of rank two over such, such or algebraic vector models of rank two over such um, varieties. This is just uh, the, the churn classes in use of ejection. Um, and now we know that this is trivial anyway. And this was proven to be trivial by Goya Shastri. So rank two bundles are trivial as well. So this settles the case in dimension two. So we have a perfect answer in dimension one and two. So what about dimension three? So we don't have a perfect answer, but we have a criterion, a sufficient and necessary criterion. So if X is a topologically contractible smooth fine complex variety of dimension three, then uh, all algebraic vector bundles on X are trivial if and only if the Chow groups in co-dimension two and three of X are trivial. So why is that? Again, uh, very general classification results. So in fact, if if X is a smooth affine complex variety of dimension three, uh, so not necessarily topologically contractible, then um, asok Fazel proved in 2014, I already mentioned this result earlier, but let me remind you again. So they proved that uh, rank two bundles are completely classified by their churn classes uh, in Chao one and Chao two. And Kuma Murti uh, proved in 1982 that uh, the analogous um, um, result for rank three bundles uh, holds as well. So uh, in other words, for three folds, vector bundles are completely classified um, by their churn classes. So now we know that for topolo topologically contractible smooth fine complex variety, Chao one is always trivial. So it remain it, this, this triviality Remain the tri triviality that remains to be checked is whether Chow two and Chow three are actually trivial. So this is exactly this criterion. So maybe this can be done in the future. Um, so what about dimension four? And this is where my uh, um, 
work is applicable. So um, this was already done in my thesis. So if uh, X uh, is a smooth defined variety of dimension four of an algebraically closed field, again, with the property that six is a unit, uh, then algebraic vector bundles on X are trivial if all the Chow groups are trivial and if furthermore this this uh, um, cohomology group with values in the third power of the fundamental ideal sheaf is trivial. So let me sketch the proof. So this is not necessarily over the complex numbers. It's over algebraically closed field um, with this property that six is a unit. So first of all, the triviality of Chow groups just implies that this reduced uh, K0 group is trivial. Um, and because char one is just corresponds to V1, just means that line bundles are trivial. So um, yeah, that's that. So we have this exact sequence in K theory. So because this is trivial, um, it means that this is an isomorphism. So all the vector bundles will be stably trivial. Stably trivial. So this implies that the triviality of all vector bundles will follow from cancellation results because everything is stably trivial. We just have to check whether it's trivial. So if stability or cancellation properties hold. So now we already have Fazal Rao Swan and Susin who proved uh, results on cancellation of stably free modules. So Fazal Rao Swan's theorem shows that stably free models of rank three are trivial. Susan's result proves that stably free models of rank four are trivial. So the remain and V1 was already trivial. So um, the only remaining set is V2, so rank two bundles. And this was settled by my work. So um, I have no time to really do this, but uh, it's a straightforward uh, spectral sequence argument. So uh, these groups appear naturally in the gerson grotnik with spectral sequence and also this group WSL. So if these groups are trivial, and this is where this H2, X, uh, I3 um, vanishing um, is used. So if this is trivial, then naturally WSL of R is trivial as well. And uh, yeah, I just explained. Oh, in my talk why why this is means that stably free modules are free so in particular since, since everything is stably trivial this means that rank two bundles are trivial okay so this this is the was the missing piece in this in this theorem so the, all the, the basically up to here my work was not used but then the missing uh, piece was my work so uh Corollary for the generalized stair question. So if X is a topologically contractible smooth point complex variety of dimension four, then all algebraic vector bundles on X are trivial. If the Chow groups are trivial, and now, well, we can drop I equal to one because that's trivial anyway. So it's just uh, in co dimension two, three, and four. And if this uh, cohomology group again is trivial. So um, this is the last slide, by the way. So uh, there's a conjecture by Asok Oestwehr um, that the following holds. If X is a topologically contractible, smooth or fine complex variety, and we choose a base point, then there should exist an integer, a non-negative integer, N, such that this n-fold P1 suspension of this pointed space XX is a one contractible. So, in other words, topologically contractible should imply uh, stably A1 contractible. So if this is the case, if this would be true, then um, this would automatically imply uh, that we have an affirmative answer to the generalized stair question in dimensions three and four because of the criteria that I, that I explained uh, a few minutes ago and well, just one minute ago. Um, maybe I should say something on this uh, conjecture. Um, this is motivated to some degree 
by the motivic conservativity conjecture. So this implies that the ration, rational motive of a topologically contractible variety should be should be trivial. And um, so it's not it's it's consistent with examples um, with many examples that actually the integral so the the Wawotsky motive of of a topologically contractible variety should be trivial and uh, and in dimension two this was actually proven by Asok so if we deal with surfaces then I can go back now actually so the result by Goya Shastri was that Chao two of a topologically contractible smooth fine surface is trivial, but Asog actually proved more. He proved that um, I think in 2000, 2011, I think. So he proved that um, uh, the motive of such a variety is trivial. So um, hence the the variety would be stably in one is stably in one contractible. So uh yeah this is the motivation for this conjecture it's consistent with examples and it's just true uh, in dimension two but not known in higher dimensions so if it would be known this would uh solve the generalized set question in dimension three and four okay that's all i wanted to explain uh i'm now happy to answer further questions and thank you very much uh for your attention yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have a quick question on this last corollary. Mm -hmm. uh, am I right that this topological contractibility condition used only to, to see that Chao 1 is trivial? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. all those are assumptions, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Do you think that uh, I mean, suppose that you are given with a topological, con I mean, suppose that you are given with some smooth variety of arbitrary dimension, mm -hmm. and suppose that all oh, Chow groups are trivial, and I don't know, all cohomology with coefficients and powers of the fundamental idea are trivial. Do you think that it could be sufficient for This is something of... I want to do in the future. <laughs> so, uh... I have this idea to to use um, so the Wasserstein symbol is psi three so it's the psi three morphism uh, it's induced by psi three um, yeah. this degree morphism so if we use higher degree morphisms it could be that uh, the triviality so this question is related to um, basically not WSL but higher Grotenik width groups. And this, these higher Grotenik width groups uh, can be computed uh, by using guess and Grotenik width spectral sequences. So studying these spectral sequences might then lead to cohomological criteria for the triviality of stably trivial vector bundles of rank D minus two. So this is what I did for D equal to four, basically. So for D minus two, rank D minus two bundles, it might show when stably trivial rank D minus two bundles are actually trivial. And then combining this with uh, this vanishing of Chow groups all the time will then automatically give a criterion for higher dimension. Yeah. But uh, it's just wide open how, how to, to do it. It's something I really want to do in the future. So do you think that this higher degree maps sh should be also bijective? Under some assumption on dimension. Um, I think I think uh, what might appear there, um, because what is used implicitly, I'm just uh, in the moment I try to understand my own computations from a more general um, perspective. So what I think is is key to my computations is that uh, SL four, which somehow appears uh, on occasion in my computations, SL four is the spin group is um, spin three, I, I think. Um, yeah, spin six, yeah. Uh, spin six, yeah, and for an, an equal to three, spin six, yeah. So um, so um, if you look at how Susan came up with his Susan matrices, he, he chose uh, generators 
of Clifford algebras uh, and use them to define these these um, these SUSY matrices. And I think that um, when we when we look at these higher degree morphisms, we will have to use uh, spin groups and look more on on maybe fiber sequences and so on of these spin groups. I think this is something which will appear naturally when we deal with uh, higher degree morphisms. So I don't know. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say they are bijective. I don't. I don't expect them to to be bijective, but I expect them uh, to to somehow encode um, the triviality of this orbit space. And there's a very recent result by Vini Chintala who who proves that some some orbit spaces. I think he proves that um n modulo e n is in bijection to um n modulo e p e, e pin so elementary spin groups um, so he he proves these equalities of these orbits so i think in the future um these these orbit spaces uh from the beginning of the talk uh, or basically the whole talk can be studied using spin groups i i would say that's my expectation and then we we have somehow uh these degree morphisms which are built on SUSY matrices in a way which are related to spin groups. So I, I my guess would be that I'm trying to understand this right now. Uh, my guess is that this somehow has something to do with uh, um, uh, this cancellation properties of stably free modules. So this is my guess right now. But I have to understand it better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Are there any more questions? No, okay, then one more question from me. Uh, when you talked about this generalized Wasserstein symbol, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you took uh, rank two, uh, I mean, rank two oriented projective model, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but orientation was used just as, I mean, in fact, you used not that it is oriented, but that it is symplectic, right? Yes, yes. Can you define some kind of generalized Wasserstein symbol for bigger rank, but for symplectic no, no, models? Not. I have I've thought about that, but no, not at the moment, no. Okay. It's yeah, maybe, but I, I'm not sure how. <laughs> uh, are there classic? I, I don't I don't know what I mean. Uh, I know the story quite bad. Are there classical Wasserstein symbol for big for bigger rank? Uh, there's something, uh, well, there are for bigger rank. Um, you mean for, for, I mean, the Wasserstein symbol just uh, exists, or the manic, there are many symbols. So um, for higher row, uh, the length of the row um, yeah. is, is bigger. Yeah. Many symbols. Um, and they were studied by, by Susan and Wasserstein as well, and also by Fazel. Um, but uh, I don't know how to generalize manic symbols at this moment uh, to to uh, projective modules uh, and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah. And so what is moment, what is codomain for them? Uh, this is the universal manic group. So you you uh, define a group basically uh, on symbols. Um, for any row, there's an element. It's a free group on the on the um, unimodular rows of length of this length, and mm -hmm. uh, modulo some relations uh, by by elementary matrices, basically. So you just define a group, uh, the the natural associated group, and then you look at the bijectivity of these maps. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, actually, one can induce um, this induces a group structure also on these orbit spaces. Mm -hmm. And there's very there are very famous results by Van der Kall, Wilbert van der Kallen. And I think the, the, those were already also um, studied by Asok Fazel recently in one of their papers on co multiple of, of spheres, I think. Yeah, something like that. And so, yeah, these are, uh, they were studied, yes, but. So in many cases, the, the orbit space um n modulo en has a group structure in quite many cases. 
does it have any relation to admission case here? Yes, um, uh, I think uh, one can uh, one can identify these these groups that I just said. These three groups, one can associate them with um, uh, Nisnevich cohomology groups of uh, um, of the variety um, with values in Milnovit uh, Milnovit uh, K theory oh, sheaves. Okay. I mean, this is done in. Uh, I don't know the name of the paper right now. Uh, if you look at Fazel's work, you can you can you will find papers where he proves something like this. So, um, weave manacle symbols. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the name of the paper right now, but okay, no problem. Did you find this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will find it. Thanks.